Think about this one. Raise your hands if you like being different. Oh, that's great. I'd like to see you embrace your individuality. That's awesome. Now, being different is not easy. A lot of you people raise your hands because you're genuinely different, and that's great. Some of you raised your hands because you felt like it was the right thing to do. And some of you didn't raise your hands because you're really different. And you're afraid to expose yourself. Put your heart out there. Put your soul out there. It's really hard. I've been different all my life. I can never fit into a box. Everywhere in life, people try to put people in boxes. Well, they're this way. They walk this way. They dress this way. They sound this way. They eat this way. They live this way. They drive that type of car. So they must think like X, Y, or Z. They must be Democrat. They must be a Republican. They must be independent. See what I mean? So I never fit well into boxes. And that made me different. But I learned to embrace my difference over years. And I learned to articulate what it was that made me different. One of the things was I was born with a very, very rare visual impairment called congenital retinoschisis. I just learned how to spell it like five minutes ago. <laughs> it's a Latin word for splitting of the retina. They cannot fix it. They cannot do surgery. They cannot give me glasses to wear because everyone's like, why don't you get arcade, man? Why don't you get surgery, dude? Why don't you wear glasses? Hey, Mark, why don't you wear contact lenses? I, I never thought of that. Wow, that's a great concept. Maybe I should consider that. No. They can't fix my eyes. It's so rare. We can send people to the moon. We can do all things technologically. We can FaceTime while we're driving. Just kidding. But we can't fix vision. But that's okay. I was born this way. I was told all my life, things are going to be a little bit different for you. And I adapt. Kind of like you do, right? But being different can be really hard. It can make you angry. It can make you sad. It can make you lash out. It can make you introverted. Be very quiet. Not wanting to socialize. It can make you an extrovert. It can make you do things that you wouldn't normally do, like try to be the life of the party. Maybe uh, indulge in drugs or alcohol, or just be totally outspoken, inappropriately. Try to be the class clown, whatever that case may be. I know. I was a lot of these things. I was a lot of these things. Mark Farrell could not fit in a box then. Mark Farrell cannot fit in a box now. And that's fine with me. Now, maybe you feel different because you feel like you're not smart enough. And I know that's not the truth because I know the overall ranking of this school as well. But still, you could not feel, sometimes not feel smart enough, and that's okay. I was getting tutored pretty much all my life. As a matter of fact, how did I get into college? I got into college on a part-time probationary status. Another way that I felt different. They said, Mark Farrell, well, your grades aren't good enough. Yes, because I, my grades weren't good enough because of my visual impairment. Because I was always sitting in a front row, but I could only see a portion of what was written on the board. It took me longer to read. Therefore, my grades never really reflected how much of a genius I really am. That's the part where you're supposed to laugh. <laughs> okay. I'm not a genius, but, you know, I can hold my own. So, therefore, I got accepted into college, and they said, you have to perform at a certain level. So, therefore, another way it made me feel different. Maybe you feel different because you don't look like everyone else in your room. Maybe because you feel like you're too small. You're too short. You're too tall. You're too skinny. You're overweight. Is it real? Is it perceived? Is it your inner voice? Is it the negative thoughts you've been thinking all your life? Or is it the ads that you're looking at, the magazines, the movies that show the ideal of perfection? You have to ask yourself that. And some differences are very obvious. Like hair color, eye color, height, weight, gender, maybe sexual preference. What is a not so, oh, maybe disability. Obvious disability. Right. What about religion? Sometimes religious beliefs are obvious because people wear a different garb, yarmulkes, etc. But there's some not so obvious differences as well. Maybe the way we think, correct? Our blood type, our family lineage, maybe what part of the country, what part of the world we're from makes us different. But sometimes it's not so obvious. There's so many things. Our sexual preference, LGBTQ, we don't know. With somebody, this is a very 
experimental age where you go from 7th, 8th grade to high school to college to your first job. You're finding out who you are. You're developing the core of your being, the soul of who you are. And that's a lot to incorporate. Now sometimes we judge people based on our differences. And I'm guilty of this just as everybody else is probably in this room. But the only difference is, and I'm sure many of you are like this as well, you don't react on how you judge. So you judge a book by a cover. You're in a library or you're in a bookstore, Barnes & Noble. Cover boring, boring, boring. Oh, that's like a great cover. So you open it. But you bypassed all those other books that could have been equally as compelling or even more compelling. So we look at people, we size them up. Rich, snob, poor, unintelligent, heavy, poor, they don't care, lazy. We have labels in this country and in this world for every possible person, scenario, class, caste system that you can imagine. Because we like to put people in a box. I can't be in a box. It's not comfortable for me. Because everything I've done, academically, socially, sports-wise, has not allowed me to fit into a box. So I have what they call, love this term, an invisible disability. No, I can't go boof and go into thin air. Rather, my disability isn't worn on my sleeve, meaning it's not obvious. So it's obvious, though, when I pull out my magnifier. At the diner I was at an hour before, and the waitress looked at me kind of odd. She didn't say anything. But usually I get, what, are you blind? <laughs> No, uh, no, I'm not blind. Uh, when did you have your lobotomy? <laughs> Removal of the brain. So people can be very, very callous, very mean, very negative. Sometimes it's because they're ignorant. But there's a difference between ignorance and lack of education. Ignorance means they know that they're going to hurt somebody or say something purposeful that's going to hurt somebody. Lack of being educated. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, do you have bad eyes? Is there anything I can do for you? Do you need help getting up those stairs? Do you need help? Riding um, that bicycle, because I know one leg's shorter than the other. We all have disabilities, real or perceived. It's what we do with these disabilities. Everybody in this room, in this state of Jersey, in this country, in this world, has a disability. Either in the way we think, maybe it's an invisible disability, or maybe it's a real physical disability. And that's the world we live in. So I felt different, just like you probably feel different, for many, many reasons. And sometimes, again, it grates on you. It's a growing experience. A lot of times when we're in a very, very difficult situation, we wish we were anywhere in this world except in our own skin because it hurts. Possibly you're getting bullied. We're failing out of a class. Your parents are getting divorced. They're fighting. Your sister or brother is going to college. Your boyfriend or girlfriend broke up with you. The person that you adore doesn't know you exist and you're really uncomfortable, and you feel different. How many of you feel not the same? But guess what, sometimes we strive to be the same because we want to be in that circle of friends. We want to be on that basketball team. So I tried sports with my visual impairment. I tried out for basketball, and unbeknownst to me, I made it. I couldn't believe it. Mark Farrow, I, I made the team? Uh, oh, okay, okay, sure, okay. So I go to basketball practice, you know, I can do pretty well on my own, but of course being a team is a team sport. Hello. So, but with all the basketballs flying around, it's very, very difficult for me to track these basketballs because I could, there's so many of them, and I, you know, I get hit, and it was very, very disconcerting. I was very on edge, could not be comfortable, obviously, so my skills suffered. And then one day, in many, many sports, for boys sports, one of the team, half the team had to take off their shirts. So you had shirts and skins. That was it for me. See, I was what they call back then, it's a polite term, husky. That's a nice way of saying, buddy, you're a little chunky. So I was a little chunky. So here I am running up and down the court. Husky Mark Farrell couldn't see the basketball as well. And I said, no, I'm not comfortable. No, this is not for me. I quit. So instead of saying, or even just taking a, a moment to pause and say, Mark, what is it about this is making you uncomfortable? Okay, it's my body image, my lack of confidence. I'm not comfortable with it. And I'm certainly not comfortable enough to go talk to the coach about it. And what about my vision? Is there something they could do to possibly make my practice 
a little bit more accommodating to me. Maybe I practice like with three guys at a time, so maybe there's only one basketball. There are many, many options that could have been, been investigated or uh, exercised. But I never gave myself a chance. I never went up to the coach. I lied. Kind of a lie, because I always, was always trying to earn money for a bigger and brighter and faster bicycle or a motorcycle. So that's what I did, earn money. I always give myself an out. I always give myself an out. And when I had the most, most safe person in the world to go and communicate to, my brother, my older brother, who was 15 years older than me, he was born with the same visual impairment because it was the male gene that was affected. My mom was a carrier. So he was older than me. He was out of college. His eyes weren't as bad as mine. But I could say to him, hey, Mike, here's the deal. I'm doing X, Y, or Z, basketball, soccer. I quit, or this is a struggle. Any ideas? But no. I didn't even tap into my own family tree, my blood, to say, I need help. We all need help at things that we do. School-wise, advice in life, everyone's got questions. My four-year-old, seven-year-old are hammering me with questions all the time. You know why? I tell them, never stop asking questions. Because in life, I'm a great teacher, but I'm even a better student. Because everyone in this room knows something I don't know. And I know something in this room that everyone else doesn't know. So it's a give and take. This was an incredible day. One of those days in your life, and we all have those, even at your young age, that you'll never, ever forget. I'm in woodshop. The saws are going. People are working, sanding, cutting, designing. And the teacher goes, okay, everybody stop, listen up. He got very, very frustrated. Because nobody was listening or they're handling tools very dangerously. He goes, stop, 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 quiet. If anybody wants any wood cut from now on, you come see me. Or Mark. And I was like, what? Whoa, no, 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 no. <laughs> Mr. Brum, I, I... Now, the reason why he allowed me to do that because he knew I was so careful even using the most dangerous tool in the room, the table saw, which the saw can come up about four or five inches, can take your forearm off. But he knew I was extremely cautious, exercise caution. And that made me so proud. A guy who couldn't do so many things in life, but was allowed and announced in front of my peers, my colleagues, my students, fellow students, that I could be someone who's industrious and operate machinery that they were no longer allowed to use. So that was very rewarding. I've done things with my hands that I realize not only is an art form, everybody needs a release in life to be creative, whether to sing, dance, play the guitar, draw, sketch, uh, read, write poetry, become a laureate, an actor, an actress, architect, whatever that case may be. Anyone heard of a triathlon? Raise your hands. Cool, very cool. So it's three sports, three disciplines in one day, swimming, biking, and running. Yeah, crazy in one day. So I trained for this big event. And I did this event for two reasons. Number one, because I thought people would think I was really cool. And subconsciously, I realized later on, like, yeah, I did it more for other people than for my own good. I realized I was trying to prove to people that even though I'm visually impaired, I'm strong. Mind and body, I'm strong. So I warm up, and they're like, OK, five minutes to start, no problem. Get out of the water. I looked at the guy to my right and said, hey, my name's Mark, my first trial, and he said, good luck. I'm looking out at this beautiful lake. Hmm. Hey, buddy, where's the race course? He goes right over there. Oh, okay, thanks. Oh, no. Uh-oh. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's right over there? Yeah, oh, thanks. Yeah, I can see it. Thanks, appreciate it. Oh no, I can't see it. I can't see it. Uh -oh. So I start to freak out. How could I have been so naive not to have thought this through that you have that good eyesight to swim in the water with hundreds of other people and follow a course? Mistake number one. So I start freaking out. I dig my toes into the sand. I start splashing water into my face. What am I going to do? My parents are behind me, my girlfriend. I mean, I, I can't quit. I haven't quit anything in my life that I didn't really have control of. Yeah, basketball, I quit. And soccer, I quit because I couldn't track the basketballs. I could tell you that I didn't quit school. I just didn't give myself or try hard enough because I knew it just didn't work out because I was missing so much information on the boards and I was always behind. I could never catch up. But this right here, this is different. This is like a test of 
endurance, strength, mental and physical. Now I have to quit? Oh man, not cool, not cool. All right, few seconds left till the race starts. Oh my God, what am I gonna do? Still can't see, I'm smoking now. All right, maybe I can see it now. No, I can't see it. All of a sudden, it came to me. Oh my God, I'm a genius, I know what I'm gonna do. I'll just follow everybody. That's what I'll do, I'll follow everybody. Yes, great, I got a plan. I freaked out over nothing. Woo, that's cool, let's move on. Gun goes off. Stroke, stroke, breath, I'm going. Stroke, stroke, breath, stroke, stroke, breath. I pick up my head, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm like, hey, I'm in the middle of a triathlon, the swim part, very cool. I pick up my head, everyone's over there, and I'm over here. Oh. So this is the way this race is gonna go. Again, I could have not thought this through. All I had to do though was lift up my arm, and any one of the countless lifeguards in a kayak Rowboat, we're gonna come over, boop, pick me right up, shovel me right to the beach. My parents would have hugged me, my girlfriend would have given me a big hug and kiss, and we all would have gone out to lunch and had a good time. But that wasn't gonna fly with me. That would have been quitting. That would have been letting myself down. Don't you know, and haven't you ever, and hopefully you haven't, but we've all probably to some degree let ourselves down because you know you should have worked harder or done something or been somewhere for somebody or even for yourself. Maybe you've never even told anybody this, even your best friend. Because some things we keep from our best friends. Because we really don't want them to know who we really are. We don't let these people in because we're embarrassed. Because we wear a mask. Everyone's wearing a mask today. Some of you are so unhappy right now you want to cry. Maybe you cry when you go to the men's room or the boys' room or the ladies' room. Maybe a faculty member has to go out to their car or can't wait till they leave here because life is so strenuous, so tough. They're going through such a difficult period of time in their life. Everybody has it. When you know somebody, or even when you don't somebody, you never know what kind of battle they're facing. A day, a week, a month could be a year. So here I am in this race. I had to make a decision. Should I keep forging ahead or should I quit? Nope, I put my head down. Stroke, stroke, breath, stroke, stroke, breath, stroke, stroke, breath. I pick up my head, I'm way off course again. And I'm saying to myself, I paid good money for this. I volunteered for this. This is a recreational sport. And this is sucking right now for me. This is not fun. But I'm committed, I'm committed. I'm in over my head, literally, leap of blind faith. So I put my head down, stroke, stroke, breath, stroke, stroke, breath. And all of a sudden I pick up my head, I see something that it looks like I'm in orbit because this huge marine covered ball was the turnaround point. And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I didn't see that from the beach. This thing I'm swimming up to, I'm going like, I couldn't even see the, like, the, the part where it starts going around because all I saw was straight up. So I'm so stoked. I'm starting swimming around it, around it, around it, around it. And all of a sudden I'm completely blinded. The sun is in my eyes. But for a moment, it was amazing. The sun rays were coming through the water. Air bubbles were coming up. And it was blissful. It was really tranquil. There I am. All of a sudden, wham! Oh, that's right, it hit the leg. I'm in a triathlon. I gotta stop enjoying this beautiful, tranquil, peaceful moment. So I swim, I swim, I'm swimming. But of course, now I can't see the land. You think the land is easier to see than the course buoy that I couldn't see, but land is land, right? It's big, takes up a lot of space. I should be able to see it, but I can't because the sun is completely blinding me. I muddle through it because that's what we do in life. Sometimes we don't have the answers, but we have sometimes an innate sense like, okay, well, if I keep doing this, I think I'll probably get to the end, work my way through this somehow. Maybe this math formula, I'm not sure if this is the correct way, but I'm gonna keep working it through to see if I get the correct answer. So that's what I did. I finally reached the water's edge, I stand up. My legs, my bodies, my arms, my chest were completely pumped. I was jacked. The swim is behind me. Thank God. I'm running, running, running to the transition area. Woo! Oh my God, I never bargained. It would be so challenging, so arduous, so tough. I get into the transition area where, again, competitors are only allowed. I start running up and down the aisles looking for my bike. Um, but... When I checked in, there was far fewer bikes. I can't find my bike. I can't find my bike. You can't do the bike portion without a... Yeah. Finally, I'm going up and down, up and down, up and down. 
I find my bike, Lickety Split. I call my bike Lickety Split. No, I don't have any weird names for teddy bears on my bed or anything. This is the only thing I have that has a name. Lickety Split, for obvious reasons. So I get on this bike, and I get on the road, and I'm going zoom, 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 flying down the road. Now you're saying to yourself, so Mark, you tell us that you're visually impaired, you have an invisible disability, but you're on a bike cranking down the road. Now I realize for the first time in my life that I have a disability. Obvious or not, I have a disability. I'm visually impaired. I couldn't see that race. I never even thought of myself disabled before this race because if I did, I would have said, okay, what may be a challenge? Seeing the swim course, note to self, huh? Maybe I should take some precautions. What could I do in advance? But I didn't even think of myself as being someone with a disability. So when I'm doing this run, that's what I thought about. And I realized it's not so important that I have a disability. It's that I'm resilient. That on the fly, during the race, I adapted. Just like in life, things change all the time. And that's why when things change, a lot of us get very uncomfortable. Whoa, uh, not so much maybe your age, but when you get older, people like to do things the same way all the time. And it's boring. A lot of times when you're in a box in a safe part of your life in a zone, people like to be that way. I don't like to be that way. But I realized that I was able to do whatever it took to get through that race. And there I was. Heading towards the finish line. Now, that's my triathlon leap of faith story. Everyone has a triathlon in life. Making a basketball team, a sport, getting into school, getting out of middle school and getting to college or high school. Getting that person maybe that you think is the world to recognize you. Maybe to have that bully realize that you're a person. And they have no right to mistreat you in any way, shape, or form. There's countless ways that we have challenges. And everyone will have triathlons for the rest of their lives. That was many, many years ago. And I have yet, yet to see a swim course. But I do not let that prevent me from doing triathlon after triathlon. Because I know one thing for sure. My difference makes me stronger. And once, I actually was the bully. Yeah, I was the bully. There was a guy named Jerry in my class who may have been of special needs. I never knew then, don't know now. But I felt just like Carl. There's my target. So one day in gym class, don't know the reason why, don't remember what led up to it, I pushed him against the locker. And as I'm doing this, I'm like, it's wrong. And I did it. And some punches were thrown. It got broken up pretty quickly. I don't think I got in trouble because it was in gym class and locker room. They got broken up. They broke us up pretty quickly. Gym teacher came over, I think said a few words, and we were okay. I apologized profusely. That was many, many years ago. And we were fine after that. I saw him in a jiffy lube about 10 years ago. Some guy comes out of the, the bay where they changed the oil and says, Hey, Mark, how you doing? This guy's covered in grease. Couldn't be any happier to see me. And I'm scratching my head because I'm visually impaired and it's been a long time. I'm like, hey, man, what's up? That's my stock response. Hey, hey, how you doing? I don't know who the hell you are. He's talking. I'm like, it's Jerry. Oh, my God. Jerry's smiling. He's beaming. Jerry's happy. I don't know what Jerry's doing in his life, what's going on with Jerry, but Jerry's genuinely happy to see me. But I'm the one who did the physical and or mental harm and or turmoil to Jerry. And I have, I believe, more of the lasting effects. And he was cool. And I was with my wife at the time, I'm like, honey, you got any more money, more cash? I said, tip him, over tip him, over tip him, because that'll fix everything. Wrong. That was me just trying to wipe away my guilt. About a month ago, I'm in a UPS store waiting and a guy in front of me is taking a really long time because he keeps asking a series of questions. And the woman at the counter is giving him responses, kind of the same responses. And I realize that this person probably needs some assistance. So I speak up and said, oh, maybe you should try X, Y, or Z. You know, we've all been dealing with Verizon for a while, right? 
So I gave him some insight. He turns around and goes, Mark. And I'm like, hey, dude. Because again, I don't know who it is. He's like, it's Jerry. I'm like, Jerry. So meanwhile, I'm thinking, I speak about Jerry all the time, nationally, to schools. Jerry doesn't know this. But Jerry knows what I did to him. Is Jerry fine with it? I don't know. He's telling me about his life, and the whole time I'm thinking, open your mouth, Mark. Tell him. Apologize. Speak to him. Spill your guts, even though you were fine for all those years after high school and during high school. But I said, this isn't the right time. He told me he's engaged. His girlfriend, who I remember pulling up to because there's one person sitting in an empty parking lot in the car, was out in the car. I'm like, I just pulled up next to her. He's like, I said, can I meet her? He goes, sure. We go out, and he's happy. He's proud to show me his fiance. And of course... I say to him, well, when do you get married? He goes, well, next year. I'm like, do you have a DJ? He goes, no. I said, I'll do it. Why do you think I'm doing it? Guilt. Guilt is an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. I'll probably end up paying him to let me DJ his wedding. So we took a picture. I said to his fiance, can you take a picture? She took a picture of us. And I sent it to him about five minutes later. I said, it was so great to see you. And guess what? He sent me a text a few weeks ago and said, would you like to come to my engagement party? And I, it's breaking my heart, man. So I have a radio show. I'm talking about this on the radio. And, and of course, calls are coming in going like, what else? You're going to build up a house? You're going to do this? You're going to you know, uh, pay for his first child to be born? No. I'm going to sit down with him and tell him, i got to come clean for me. And he may even say to me, Mark, I don't remember this. Or Mark... Yeah, that was really kind of screwed up what you did, but you apologize. And I'm fine with it. But that's how long things live with you. For that long. So think about that the next time you speak down to somebody. Or you're not courteous to somebody. Or you don't give somebody a hand, a helping hand. That's all it takes. Talk to somebody with respect. If they talk differently from you, that doesn't mean they think differently or they're a bad person. It means they come from a different part of the state, the country, or the world. Embrace that. Tap into that. I remember one day, a little fuzzy, went to my first frat party. So I came back after I could... I probably had beer coming out of my ears. That's how much beer I consumed. I get into an elevator. Now, a conventional way to ride an elevator is you go in the elevator, the door shut, push a button, you hear some bad music, and you wait to your floor. The door is open, you get out. Then I looked up. Oh, what's that? That's a hatch. Wow. Wonder what's up there. Everyone's in there. Yeah, Mark, 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 I don't know what I just said. That could never be transcribed. So the hatch goes open, I get hoisted, I'm riding up and down on this elevator. Did I ever, ever conceive or think about the fact that the elevator may not have enough clearance on the top and I may go smush? <laughs> R.I.P. Mark Farrell. No, I'm riding up and down, up and down, it wasn't good enough for me to just do that. I figured, I think it was a five-story building I lived in. Yeah, five stories. So, I hang, it's an I-beam, an I-beam is exactly what it sounds like, it's top piece, middle piece, bottom piece. I hang from my feet, for teachers who know, it's like the guy from the Crazy Glue commercial. Upside down, I think I lost my keys or my uh, student ID card. That's how, out of my mind, how reckless I was, because I was completely inebriated, because I would do this pattern, because I thought people would like me because I felt less than whole, because I never talked to people, I never let people in to let them know how sad I really was, how I wanted to be able to see differently and better so I could perform better and do things that everybody wanted to do. I did not fit in the box. I was hurting, but I did my best, my survival mechanism to do and hang in there. I could electrocute everybody inside that elevator, dead. I, there was probably eight, ten people in that elevator. Could have fried everybody. End of story. My life would have been over. We hear of things happening in the news. You know this. Happened recently. There was multiple kids' lives who are pretty much over in freshman, sophomore year in college. It happens all the time because people do not think. See, the reason why I was seeing a therapist was because 
I was going through major, major panic and anxiety episodes. A panic attack is like, have you ever been in a car and there's been a near miss situation, your heart's like, or something happened like, okay, take that and multiply by 50 or 100. Your body's completely like, you don't know what's going on, your vision's a little blurry, your heart's jumping out of your chest, you're sweating profusely. I started having panic attacks. Anxiety is almost like you're very, very uncomfortable, it's a nervous feeling, exponentially high, combine those two, and it's really uncomfortable. I wouldn't even wish this on my worst enemy back then, even for Carl. Maybe just one day, but not more than one day for Carl. That's what I was going through. So I experienced this for all of a sudden out of nowhere, for like three, four weeks I was experiencing this. And this is part of mental health, right? We know what mental health is, mind, body. Things that we don't really talk about too much in this society. We break your leg, get Mark to the hospital, he's got a broken leg, let's reset it, cast, see in six weeks. Six weeks worth of physical therapy, you'll be fine, good. We don't talk about getting much better in the last 10 years about depression, anxiety, panic attacks. It's a little taboo, but we're making great strides. But see, I was very afraid to tell everybody about what I was experiencing because I had good reason. Because my brother killed himself a few years before that. So, I thought I was next. So how could I tell anybody what I'm experiencing? Because this is the precursor to me ending my life. Oh, man. Couldn't sleep. Here I am working at a New York City radio station sleeping maybe two hours, one hour a night. Two, three, four weeks this goes on. Changing the sheets, because I would try to lay in bed, I would sweat so much the sheets would be soaked. I'd come home from work so tired I couldn't even walk. I'd lay down for an hour or two and that would be it. Then I'd be up from eight, nine o'clock until six o'clock in the morning, shower, go to work, rinse and repeat. I was dying, literally, of fatigue. I would be conducting interviews, talking to household names, celebrities, trying to hide behind his sweat. Are you okay? Oh, I must, I must not be feeling okay. It must be something I ate. I would do everything in my power to hide this from everybody. So finally I said, I can't take this any longer. I'm going out of my mind. So I, I made up my mind to go home one weekend and to tell my mother. This is the same person I had a call a few years ago and tell her that her 40-year-old son left off the building that I lived with him. And, and then he took his life. He died by suicide. So now I have to go home and tell her mom and my sister that I think I have depression, I think I'm losing my mind, I think I'm going crazy. And then I said, well, I can take new vitamins, medication, etc. And guess what? I had this whole big thing built up in my mind and they were cool. Because they knew, first of all, they had to make me feel loved, relaxed, and sheltered. So I got help. I saw a doctor for years, talked to therapists, and it was great because a natural thing when you lose someone in your life, especially as traumatic as that, where I was actually on the scene and had to deal with many, many events during that day, it took its toll on me. And obviously I can be pretty genetically disposed to this. Depression, anxiety in your family. It runs. If not, chances are in your life, it'll happen to you. I love life. Everything has to offer, even the bad times, because you learn from the bad things in life. The good times are great. They're fun. I embrace them. Sign me up. I'm there. But the bad times, again, once we're in the middle of them, we wish we were anywhere else. But when we get out the other side, we're like, wow, it feels good. I learned a lot. I'm strong. Or I help somebody get through a really difficult time by being there for them, talking to them. This is really kind of cool. So, there are no initials after my name. It's Mark Farrow. Not PhD, not MD, but guess what? I am an expert in me. And you have to be an expert in you. You know how you think, the patterns, how your body, mind-body connection, that is so, so significant, especially when you're going through a traumatic time, if you're being bullied, if you dare dabble in drugs, See, the reason why I survived drugs is because I realized I didn't want to wake up at 40 and be an alcoholic and or a suicidal and not married. But you have to realize not to put yourself in those situations. We all have things that really tug at us, that make us sad. 
really, that really keep us awake at night. Find that safe person. Sibling. Maybe it's a parent. Probably not. Maybe it's a guidance counselor or a sack. Maybe it's a cousin, a nephew. Have that person. They could be your same age. They could be older. More sage advice. But that's really, really important. So I realized that with all my differences, years later, that I had developed a mantra all my life, but I never articulated it. I never could put it into five words. And these five words I want you to remember for the rest of your life. Because when you're feeling down, when you're feeling weak, when you're feeling lack of confidence, like you don't fit in, new job, new school, new home, new girlfriend, new boyfriend, ex-boyfriend, divorce, death, illness, whatever the case may be, you say, my difference makes me stronger. Let me hear you say it. My difference makes me stronger. My name is Mark Farrell. Thank you very much.